Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 29, 2018, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm flattered. All right, what do we talk about? Well, first of all, current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, and you can ask about whatever you want, but keep the questions to the slides. And when we get towards the charts, I'm going to open it up for general discussion on stocks in general. Feel free to ask about anything at that point. Your favorite stock picks, and wait, wait until, again, we get to the live charts for that. And ask about one stock at a time. Put the symbol in, hit enter, and you can ask about multiple symbols, he tried to say. Just make sure you only put in one at a time, and that's for your benefit to make sure that everything gets covered. So what are we talking about? Well, I think the elephant in the room is the bear. So let's continue to talk about the bear market and updated a lot of my charts to reflect signals and such. And we'll take a look at those in just one second. While I was working on my presentation this morning, I came across a few slides that I did a few years back on what trend following is and what trend following isn't. So I want to revisit that really quick, especially in light of a few things that have happened lately. There's a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, borrowing a line from my buddy Greg Morris, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, one thing that I would recommend you do real quick, if you haven't already done so, and if you are a free member or a gold member, if you're a gold member of DaveLander.com, you have a little bit more extensive market timing course, and you also will get the benefit of any new things added to that. But if you're not a member, you could join here for free. And I'd recommend you do that not for egotistical purposes so much as I'd like to see you take the free market timing course, which I think is going to help you out tremendously, especially given the current conditions. And if you don't see this banner ad on my site because all this changes, if you look up here under members, you could sign up for free there. Now, one reoccurring theme I've been talking about quite a bit is winter is coming. And if any of you guys watch Game of Thrones, which I swore I would never watch because I assumed it would be stupid, <laughs> it turns out it's actually pretty good. Anyway, that bastard Jon Snow keeps saying over and over that winter is coming. And one day he's going to be right. Now, this is from last week, but a few things that I talked about was that it might die slowly as hope waxes and wanes. And that's the process type of talk we talk about quite often. The market begins to roll over and then begins to bounce quite a bit. Everybody gets this false hope. And then it goes back and forth. Don't confuse the issue with facts. One of my favorite sayings ever is don't confuse the issue with facts. There might be reasons why it shouldn't be rolling over. There might be reasons why the economy is improving. But what is, is, and we'll come to that in just one second, revisit that, I should say. Now, in general, as we discussed quite a bit last week or a week before, I think Thanksgiving got in the way. But all stocks eventually become victims. And I found myself looking today at my portfolio, and I've got quite a few IPOs, and I've got one little energy stock in there. And I'm thinking, boy, you sure have a lot of stocks on for someone who seems a little bearish. And, well, the reason is because those are more speculative type of issues, and sometimes those guys – will have that last little run, and then eventually all of them get knocked out. But I sure would feel a heck of a lot better, and I even put in a couple of limit orders, which I'm not a huge fan of, but I even put in some limit orders right before I got started today. Just in case some of these positions continue to rally higher, I'll be taken out of at least half of them. So I am... Very much looking forward to scaling out, and this is a market where I'm not necessarily 
wanting to be very long. Now, I will take setups as they occur if I really like them. And right now I'm seeing quite a few, or I should say a few in IPOs, and those have stacked up as of late. Now, if you are shorting, I can tell you point blank that retrace rallies suck. If you're a gold member of DaveLander.com, I'd recommend you go watch the last question and answer session, which is now live. And in it, I talked about discretion, and it was on the last three shorts I recommended. All three of them required quite a bit of discretion. So it's very hard to hang on during those retrace rallies. A lot of times you get short, you're feeling pretty good. Immediately or soon thereafter, you get this huge retrace rally, knocks you out, and then the market rolls right back over. Linda Rasky once said the market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner, and she also said a corollary to that, and that corollary, as I say quite often, is that the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most amount of people. So along the obvious thing, if it's obviously headed lower, let's say a stock is obviously headed lower, then what happens first? Well, it has a big retrace rally. It does the unobvious, right? And then it goes back to doing the obvious. Well, in doing that unobvious, it frustrates the most. Those who decide to short the market. And it also, in those retrace rallies, will instantly reward the bottom pickers, and then spin them right out. And I'm going to discuss that in a little bit more detail further down the road. Now, as I alluded to a minute ago, more discretion is required. I was talking to one of you guys last night about shorting, and you never shorted before. And I said, well, you got to realize it's a pain in the butt, and you better understand discretion before you get into some shorts. And I always feel guilty when I show an example and say, look, guys, if you'd have just given this a little bit more rum, even though I said, hey, stops at whatever, let it go a little bit past that based on this discretion, applying a little discretion, and you see you could have stuck with the position. Well, I always feel like I'm pouring salt in the wounds, like I showed a slide last week of literally pouring salt in some wounds. And I worry about that, but the bottom line is, you're going to need to know this in the future. If I get hit by a beer truck, you need to know about discretion because at some point, especially in a bear market, you're going to need a little bit of discretion. Now, you have to pick your spots super carefully. And right now, about the only thing exciting I'm seeing is IPOs. And I mentioned earlier, I was long a little energy company. Well, it's set up, even though energies weren't doing so hot. I figured it was worth a shot. It's a foreign company. But other than that, there's really not a whole lot to do. So you have to be patient and wait for those opportunities to come to you. Now, as I often preach, never forget, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And along the lines of he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, it's like I woke up this morning thinking, well, some of these signals that I'm going to show you today have had some whipsaws in the past. And I know I beat the dead horse on this, and I, I'm going to keep beating the dead horse just because it's it's something that I think everybody needs to know and remember and be constantly reminded of, present company included, is that whipsaws are frustrating, bear markets are devastating. Okay, If you're getting ready to retire and you lose half your retirement over the next six to eight months, you're going to be a hurt and pop, okay? That's going to be pretty devastating. If you allow yourself to get whipsawed out and you're down, let's say, 10% and you get back in, so you miss that 10% of the run and then you're kind of slowly making it back, then you might be a little frustrated, but at least you haven't totally changed your lifestyle. Now, the whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive frustration comes from Greg Morris. Now, when it comes to tops and bottoms, every top or bottom will have a transitional pattern. Okay, let me repeat that. Every top and every bottom will have some sort of transitional pattern. Now, for me, those transitional patterns or 
bow ties and first thrusts, first and foremost. But they could be they could also be some of the other patterns that I follow, such as explosion, was it reversal gap strategy, something going way back in time that I discovered a long, long time ago, and things along those lines. But usually a first thrust and a and or a bow tie will capture most of those tops and bottoms. So every top and every bottom will have a signal. The problem is not every signal will turn into a top or a bottom. And that's where the frustrating thing of the occasional whipsaw comes along. So along the lines of every top and every bottom, if you go in and take a look at, let's say, the Russell 2000, not that long ago, up around 168, 167, somewhere in there. We had, what, a bow tie down. So if you go throughout history, take a look at bonds, take a look at gold, find, just pick your favorite market and start looking at it and say, well, where was the top and where was the bottom? And now, obviously, this is going to be in hindsight, but it's a wonderful exercise because if you do that, you'll go and say, okay, well, here's the S&P. Here's an all-time high here. Oh, look at that. We had a bow tie. And then what happened from that? The market began to sell off fairly sharply, as you know. Now, off of an all-time high, you will get an hourly bow tie, obviously, before daily. And then, obviously, you will get a daily before weekly. Somebody was asking me about that recently. You will get those lower-level signals first. A little bit more dangerous to go in on those lower-level signals, but they can be some huge opportunities. I would urge you to go in and look at the S&P every time it's making multi-year highs and take a look at like an hourly bow tie to see if there's a possible day trade type of opportunity there. Not that I'm a huge fan of day trading, but every now and then these opportunities present themselves. Same thing happens in something like Forex. And as I said before, I do like to look at the hourly bow ties off our major highs and major lows in Forex. How many times I have to tell you? <laughs> Every Thursday I do a webinar. Okay, let's do... Oh, Dave, why don't you turn your phone off? Well, I probably got about 30 voicemails as it is now because I'm so bad about answering my phone. If I turn my voice... I turned the ringer off once for one of these shows, and about six months later I realized it was off. I'm like, geez, the phone doesn't ring anymore. <laughs> Even the solicitors have forgotten me. All right, let's talk about the 10% TFM system update. If you know me, I like to keep it simple. And one of my goals over the last maybe 10 years or so, maybe even a little bit longer, has been to come up with something so simple that it's nearly ridiculous. And even, even me thinks, wow, this is so simple, it can't work. And through that, I've come up with some pretty cool things, if I say so myself. A little five-day simple moving average breakout system for IPOs, which is under, if you go to methodology, under courses, it's under IPOs. There's an IPO link, not the IPO course itself. It will become part of the IPO course, but under the members area, under IPOs, it's in there. And it's a simple little system. So this TFM system came about, let me just real quick, I know most of you probably know what it is, but for those who don't, technical analysis 101 says if a market's going to go through go from A to C, and B is somewhere in between, it's going to pass through B along the way. And that's sort of the genesis of some of my IPO type of systems. Well, I got to thinking with a market, because I often preach, as long as a market is at or near new highs, Okay, let's call new highs point C. Then you want to err on the side of longer term trend. If it's going to go beyond C, then it's going to have to be near C before that happens. So if it's around C somewhere and it's going to go beyond C, and let's say B is here and B is here and this is A and this is A on the way back down. So as long as you're somewhere around C, just stay long because if it's going to go to beyond C, not beyond C, but beyond C, then it's going to have to be near C to begin with before it goes past. Now, 
on the flip side, on the negative side, if it's going to go back to A, when it nears B, you might want to get out of the market. And that's pretty much the whole system right there. If you're near C, stay long. Did it again. And if you're near B, get out or think about shorting. All right, so let's take a look at that. And I did add a caveat in there. I added a little bitty rule to avoid some whipsaws. Now, as I've said in previous presentations, you got to be really careful when you start adding in your whipsaw rules because you could end up with a curve fit type of holy grail hunt. I remember when I first started developing mechanical systems and I've got one that sort of worked a little bit. I'm like, okay, all I need to do now is eliminate all the losing trades. Well, you can eliminate all the losing trades. So you got to be very careful in your whipsaw filter. So whipsaw filter means knock out or get rid of the false signals as many as possible. And the other problem, as I've said quite often with the whipsaw filter, is if you put too many of them in, you actually begin to create losses. So let's say in this particular case, and the only one we have here, which I'll show you in one second, is that you have downside daylight, Dave light. But let's say you say, well, we need like so many days of downside Dave light, and it has to be this and that. Well, before you know it, you might not be getting out to way down here before all those trigger, uh, signals trigger. And you've given up a big part of that trade or lost a lot of money in the process. And it's quite possible that by the time you get out, the market reverses. So you've got to be really, really careful when you start adding in those whipsaw filters because you don't want to curve fit and you also don't want to delay your trend signal too much. So I stopped myself at one trend whipsaw filter for this particular system. Now, all I'm doing is saying if the market is greater than 10% away, and I think in this particular example, I programmed in a 50-week high, okay, or 50-week closing high, that is, okay? So it's, it's cutting out too obvious here, but let's say the high was up here and the close is here. Well, this would be the closing high here, okay? The highest close for 50 weeks, looking back. So and you can see that the market then dropped more than 10% away from that high, and then has to close below the 50-day moving average. Now, on the upside, you'd have to have Dave light, meaning that the lows have to be greater than the moving average, okay? And I forget exactly how I programmed it in, maybe two bars or something like that. Now, let's take a look at where we are now in this system. And we'll zoom this in in just one second. But you can see here that we actually or now, or recently, I should say, the week ending in November 23rd, the market actually dropped more than 10% away from its 50-week closing high. The media, by the way, calls that a correction. Okay, So technically, we had a correction, but I'm actually seeing a sell signal because it also closed below the 50-week Moving average. Now, if you look at the little ribbon at the bottom, this stays bullish as long as you're within 10% of new highs and you have Dave light. The lows are greater than the moving average and you're within 10% of the new highs. And then it turns neutral when it intersects the moving average. Now, if we zoom it in, it becomes a little bit more obvious. You can see up here, it's above 10% here. The little blue line, this line here is at 10%, okay? And then we had the big up day yesterday. Now this is the weekly chart, so it looks like this is a whole week's worth of trading. It's just, I don't know how Metastock does it. Does anybody know? I know that Telechart does a rolling week meaning that today is, what's today? Thursday, it looks back to last Thursday, whereas some charting packages do a calendar week. So even though we don't have Friday's data in here, it would be 
it would show it as a weekly bar, and then the next bar would be Monday. So each bar would be Monday to Friday and not necessarily Thursday to Thursday or Wednesday to Wednesday or Tuesday to Tuesday. Or as they say in The Godfather, Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday. <laughs> so you can see anything below this 10 line here is 10%. Anything above it is going to be greater than 10%, which happened recently. And then we had Dave Light below and a close below. Now, I think we don't necessarily need Dave Light below. We just need a close below for the system. But I just want to show you that we also have Dave Light. If you go in and look at the 50-week moving average, another one of those things that's pretty amazing, as I'm going to beat the dead horse on, and as I often do, we have a lot of times – just following the bow tie moving averages, especially on a weekly basis, can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. Well, you know me, I'm always simplifying things. And I happen to notice that just by accident, having the 50 week moving average plotted. Well, if all you did was stay short for the most part, or look to short for the most part, when you're below the 50 day moving average, when the high is below, in other words, you have downside day of light and stay long as long as the lows are above the 50-week moving average, you would do pretty good at staying on the right side of the market. Now, what I'm leading to there is, as I often say, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave Light. So if we come into the weekly S&P, or if we look at the weekly S&P, I should say, and... You'll notice I have this indicator up here, and this just counts the number of days the low is greater than the 50-week moving average, and it resets. Notice right here, it touches the moving average, gives a little kiss, and it resets back to zero. And the same thing happens on the downside. Back here, if you squint your eyes, you can see we had a little tiny bit of Dave light to the downside. But then notice in these major bear markets, you have a lot of red. So mostly green in the bull markets, maybe a little bit of red here and there on corrections. And by corrections, I don't necessarily mean 10%. I just mean pullbacks or potential times when things look a little iffy. And then notice that it stays mostly green in the major bull markets. So another little tool to help keep you on the right side of the market. And all we're using is Dave light and a 50 week moving average by the way these are free at metastock if you do buy metastock get it through me and i'll make a few dollars and i'll put that money back into the website for you i'll give it back and again you can see we take a look at the bull market that started in 2009 mostly green a little bit of red here and there we did have that correction back in 2011 where things looked a little iffy looked a little questionable and then of course we had the great run from 2012 on now 2015 16 that was a little iffy back then i would say that's a little bit more than a correction in fact as i'm going to show you in one second and reiterate or beat the dead horse have you want to look at it the russell 2000 lost like 18 percent of its value in that slide so it was nothing to sneeze at from a weekly bow tie and then again the last run we had we had a pretty good amount of dave light the other thing that i've gleamed from this is that when you get about let's see if this pen's going to work when you get about oh almost 100 weeks i should say of Dave Light, you tend to get a correction. Doesn't mean that you rush out and sell all your stocks. Just means that you honor your stops. And if you're getting offered some profits, then take them. Now, it's not the end of the world just yet, but you can see, you probably won't see it on your screen, but if you squint your eyes, we have one little tiny bar of red here. So that could be the beginning of something. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But it pays to pay attention. Now, let's take a look at the death cross. 
potentially in the S&P 500. This indicator probably gets way too much attention, probably just because of the name. But there are some interesting characteristics about it and some things that you need to know. But before we get to that, you can see that the 50-day moving average is coming down really, really fast. And it looks like it's going to intersect this 200-day moving average fairly soon. And as I often say, the reason that is is because you're adding in prices down here and then you're taking off prices down here. So even if the market kind of goes sideways in here, this moving average will begin to catch up to that one. Now, without going into a lot of details, we actually, I was part of a hedge fund many years ago, and that was part of my job to look at where that moving average would likely be, even if the market didn't move, because the moving average was a big part of what we did. Now, the rusty is looking pretty rusty in here, and that's a little concerning, because we already had the death cross in the Russell 2000. Now, let's take a look at the NASDAQ composite. The NASDAQ composite, believe it or not, probably in part due to the drop-off effect, has formed a death cross down. That's when, again, for those of you who aren't familiar, in case you've been living under a rock or just new to trading, I don't want to make fun of anybody, but the media just gets its panties in a wad when there's a death cross. But the NASDAQ did cross below the 50-day moving average did cross below the 200-day moving average. Now, again, these signals in and of themselves are nothing to get too excited about, but what you need to pay attention to is the magnitude of what happens next. So let's say you were saying, okay, what do you mean by that, Dave? Well, you had a sell signal here, and now you got a buy signal here. Well, you draw your line. Let's see where that sell signal is, somewhere in here. And you draw a line forward, okay? And you pretty much broke even if you shorted on that trade, right? And you bought back in somewhere here. Well, I don't think that's what you should do with any signal is wait until you have a contrast signal from that signal. What you do is you pay attention to what happens in between, in this particular case, you had a pretty serious drop, at least on a net-net basis. Obviously, it wasn't a route lower, but from there down to there, I think is like 16% or 17%. And I know from the bow tie signal, it was probably, as I said earlier, I think 18% or so on a weekly basis, weekly bow tie down. So it's nothing to sneeze at. Now, if you took that weekly bow tie down and you got it back, you got out the short side, got back long, you probably made 0% on the trade by waiting for that contra signal, that opposite signal. The point I'd like to make with the death cross or any signal for that matter, not just the death cross because I'd like to pick on these stupid little things like this, but it does have some use. It is a longer term trend following methodology. And after you get that signal, the market can have a pretty substantial run lower. If you test it out mechanically, eh, it doesn't really work that well. It's very, very, very tiny edge. An edge so small, you definitely would not want to trade it. But that doesn't mean that you should ignore it. And the reason you should not ignore it is because that or any other signals, whether it's a big day signal or somebody else's signal, if trend following signal, something conceptually correct, of course, not some stupid, I don't want to throw anybody in a bus, but you know the methods that I'm not a big fan of. Buy me a beer and I'll tell you all about them. <laughs> I'm dieting, so I would. that'd be great if you did that. Anyway, so the magnitude is what you really have to worry about with these death cross type of situations. Now, I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this. And I took it out last week, but I think it's important to put it back in again. The bow tie moving averages, especially off of major, major highs, okay? You'll see a few little intermediate signals in here, but the ones that I'm pointing out to you are off of major highs and major lows. Now, the software in Metastock didn't catch the one in 
2009, but there were other signals there too. And it was a little bit of what I call a sloppy bow tie back up. And then we had a major sell in 2015. Now that didn't turn into the mother of all sell signals in the S&P 500, but as I've been saying at nauseam throughout today, it did turn into an 18% slide into Russell 2000, which is nothing to sneeze at. So what I would encourage you to do is pay careful attention to what's going on in these bow tie moving averages on a weekly basis. And if you see a major sell signal, I would take that very, very, very seriously. And even this signal here, this is like a minor buy and a minor buy. I wouldn't count those. This one actually isn't a buy. I wouldn't count it as a buy. But this one is a minor buy right here. That's a minor buy. But if you look at what happened after that major sell, that was still a pretty serious sell-off in the overall market. I guarantee you, if you were long a bunch of stocks in general, you probably would have gotten knocked out of all of them. And if you held on to them, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, if you didn't own your stops, you probably would have lost a lot of money on those stocks. And if they came back, the market just taught you to what? Always hold on. Well, that'll work until they don't. And there's that minor buy right there. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, take a look at the P's, you can see that the 10-day simple, or in this case, 10-week simple, and by the way, I just... I get mixed up a little bit because I think a market, a period is a period. Whether it's a five-minute chart or a 60-minute chart or a weekly chart or a monthly chart. So in this case, it's a 20, it's a 10-period moving average, a 20 exponential, 20-period exponential, and a 30-period exponential moving average. But in this particular case, we're using weekly. Now, as I said earlier, or alluded to at least, Two things, and I don't have the 50 in here, but 50 would probably be down here like this, 50-week moving average. As long as you had daylight above the 50, stay long. As long as these moving averages are in uptrend proper order, stay long. And you'll notice here this green ribbon stayed bullish for a long, long time. Now, you can see that here when the moving averages began to meander back and forth, it goes to neutral. And then should they all cross down to where that 10 is below the 20 and 20 is below the 30, then it would turn red and be bearish. So pay very careful attention to a potential signal in the works there. And if I zoom in the chart a little bit, you can see very obviously the 10 has sliced through both of those. And this 20-day or in this particular case, 20 week, I'm sorry, 20 period, I should say, moving average is headed down, and that is a weekly chart. Now, the Rusty's looking pretty rusty because it already had a weekly bow tie down, and notice that the ribbon down here has turned bearish. Now, technically, this would be, I'd see this as a weekly first thrust, and your entry would be here, but if you're waiting for the bow tie, officially, we now have a bow tie in the Russell 2000. Last time it was good for 18%, again, off of all time highs. It'll be interesting to see if it triggers how big of a slide we will have. So you heard it here first. Now, obviously, we had a daily bow tie many, many weeks ago, probably about, was it 165, somewhere way up there. Now, I left this slide in from last week simply because, once again, we're just having a ridiculous ridiculous amount of bottom picking at tops. So what I mean by that is market's doing this, looks like that. That's really frustrating. I don't know what's going on with this pen. Somebody needs to buy me a new pen for Christmas. But what I'm talking about is market rolls over, it looks kind of like that. All of a sudden, out of the woodworks, a lot of these bottom pickers come along. And I don't know if I have an extra chart here on the S&Ps, but what I wanted to show you today, my pen will cooperate, is a lot of bottom pickers were all excited here. Oh, it's the bottom, it's the bottom. And then the market rallies up like, see, I told you. Well, what I'm wondering is, did they sell out right here or are they still holding on down here? Because notice that a lot of them are calling bottoms once again. 
Now, getting back to the bottom at tops is when a market is rolling over like this, for me, it's very hard to pick a bottom up here. Now, if a market goes down like this, it bottoms out for a long, long time. Bottoms out for a long, long time and then begins to bow tie something, then, yeah, I'll call a bottom then. But when it's at high levels like this, it's a little bit more dangerous to call a bottom. So I would I would urge you not to do that. And as I said over the past few weeks, it ain't over till it's over, okay? This market is going to bounce around quite a bit, and it's going to give false hopes to the bulls. And, and of course, it's going to reinforce the bears quite a bit, too, and then ultimately do what it's going to do. In the meantime, I would stay cautious and remain setup driven. The other thing I probably should add into this is you probably should use a little bit of money management or a lot of bit of money management. Now, short points. Obviously, stop points are obvious enough to be taken out. I don't know what that means. Before the top and after the top for transitions, before the bottom and after the bottom for transitions. Thanks, Dave. Elvis is in the building. Hey, Elvis. <laughs> Lost you for the last 20 minutes. Well, I hope you find me, Howard. Following my plan, not calling anything, following signals both in and out. Okay. You know, if you're following your plan and your plan says buy and sell, then follow your plan. That's There's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with that, okay? In fact, I would commend you for following your plan. Okay, and going through my slides, as I said earlier, I came across some slides on what trend following is and what trend following isn't. And I thought it'd be pretty relevant today, especially since, and I don't want to go into a lot of details on this, but I was helping someone recently who had to get out of the market for various reasons, and one of which was concern about the market. Like I said, last week, or when, whenever, when I say last week, last show, people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, okay? And it was so they were selling stocks for one of those variety of reasons. And on top of that, one of the reasons was, you know, the point I was trying to make a second ago is that the people sit, buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with the stock market. Well, they had other reasons to get out of the market. And on top of that, they were asking me about how I felt about the market. And I told them that it doesn't look good. So when they called their broker who tried to stop them from selling stocks, because a lot of these guys, that's what they do. They just preach the buy and hold. Anyway, she told him, she said, well, I was talking with Dave Landry, and he predicts the markets. That's wrong. I do not predict the markets. I follow the markets, okay? And that's what trend following is. You're not predicting the markets. You're just simply following along. So let's talk about what trend following is and what trend following isn't. First of all, Trends are tough to predict, okay? And that's why I just said I don't predict the markets. I am a trend follower. So when it comes to trends, trends are tough to predict, but you can follow them forever. So let's say you have a little signal, a bow tie, or whatever you're using, provided it's conceptually correct, that suggests the market is trending in a certain direction. By the way, I don't know if I have this further in the slides, but one thing very simple that I learned or relearned from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts is in order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. I see people all the time picking tops and bottoms. Well, they're fighting the trends or they're guessing when the trend will end. That's not what trend following is all about. Now, it's tough to hold on to the trend. As I've said ad nauseum, the Bill Dunn quote, riding a trend is like riding a bouncing bronco. And it's tough. And it can be really frustrating. 
lot of times you get knocked out when? Right before that next big leg begins. And that could be really, really tough. And the way I saw for that is through a hybrid approach to money management. Go through the money management module and a learning management system, and you will know as much as I know about money management. But as I often say, you can only look so far out when you're trading a market. And that's why I'm slotted as a swing trader, because what I'm doing is I'm looking for these big picture patterns and big picture setups that I think have longer term potential, but I'm only getting in provided, of course, I think they have short term potential. And I'm only fairly confident in my short term prediction because all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So I'm going to use A, a protective stop. And then if blessed with a profit, I'm going to trail my stop higher. And if I've continued to be blessed with a decent profit, I'm going to take partial profits and I'm going to let that stop slowly loosen up to make that transition to the longer term trend follower. And I don't want to get into a lot of details on that, but obviously short term trading is really the only way you can trade markets. Unfortunately, you don't make enough and you occasionally get whacked. I know some really good short term traders. They, they get a little piece, they get a little piece, they get a little piece, they get whacked, and then they start over again. So very tough way to trade. Now, on the flip side, long-term traders, very tough way to trade. You're going to trade. You're going to be wrong about 72% of the time. Your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. So my way of trying to bring those two together is through this hybrid money management. So we can occasionally get into these longer-term trends and give them enough room to breathe. I was talking with Linda Rasky recently, and not the name drop, but I know I know Linda. I'm friends with Linda, and you know if you're in this business long enough, you know everyone. Okay, so it's not a name drop. You just know everybody. Anyway, long story endless. I was trying to talk with her a little bit about short-term trading and the problem of short-term trading, and trying to talk a little bit about getting a little longer term in the trading and such. And she said, "Well, that's." God's way of handing the trader a card. Short-term trading versus long-term trading is like handing them a card that says over on both sides. <laughs> you ever do that to somebody like in grade school or something? You get a little piece of paper that says over, and then on the other side you write over, and you see how many times they flip it over. <laughs> What's that called? How to keep an idiot in suspense? I'll tell you tomorrow. No, that's just a, another way to keep an idiot uh, occupied, I guess. Anyway... When you do catch a trend, in the end, you're going to be wrong. I often show examples where, yay, we catch this huge trend, and we're up 200%. You know, we're feeling pretty good about that. And then we get stopped out, and we only made 150% or whatever the case may be on the trade. We gave up a lot of that trend in the end. Well, I drew this as a straight line higher. It looks more like this with your little Bronco bouncing along the way. You never know when one of these corrections is just a correction or the start of something much bigger. And that's why through that ever loosening trailing stop, you eventually get stopped out. But if you loosened it enough along the way, you were able to ride out quite a few corrections. Now, you must be willing to let go of your ego. I would love to be able to predict markets. I think it'd be fun to trade one of these, arc not trade, because you, you can't. I really believe you can't. There have been, and I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but there were some very famous traders running lots and lots of money, put millions of dollars into research, into some of these arcane methods, one in particular I'm thinking of, and probably did more than that, through millions of their hard-earned dollars at these arcane methodologies and they came to the conclusion is that they're worthless so if someone's going to spend millions of dollars and they can't make it work then who am i to say well let's try this really crazy arcane thing but where, what i'm getting at is it would be fun to run some kind of predictions like that and then every now and then get it exactly right and look like a genius well that's just not me that's a little disingenuous as far as I'm concerned. And as I often say, I'm not going to throw anybody to the bus, but you know who I'm talking about. You know, one guy was right 30-something years ago. <laughs> Hasn't been right since. 
but he still has a career off of that being right once. Probably not a trading career, though. All right, more on trend trading. And that's the thing is you're not going to look smart as a trend follower. When somebody called me a trend following moron, I was deeply hurt, especially since I think I knew who it is. And he's someone famous. And he thought I was the bee's knees because I was following these great trends and he was seeing my predictions and he was amazed. I said predictions. He was seeing my following, I should say. And then he started fighting the markets because his ego got in the way. And he got pissed off and called me a trend following moron through an anonymous email, but I know it was him because it got nastier from there. He's telling me uh, all kinds of things. You're going to die broke and all this other stuff. Like, oh, shit. <laughs> so far, so good. I ain't dead yet. Um, anyway, did I just say the S word? Shoot. There goes my 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 video just got demonetized on Yahoo. Oh, well. <laughs> anyway. You're not going to look smart as a trend follower. You just have to be willing to follow along. Now, here's the thing. Trends tend to go much further and last much longer than most are willing to believe. Anybody of the trader type with a big ego who has been fighting this market over the past 10 years, or however long this bull market has gone, has lost a lot of money in the process, confusing the issue with facts. And that leads us to the next point. Don't confuse the issue with facts. Don't think, follow. The economy might be doing great, but what is, is, unless you're Bubba. And I think I have a Bubba coming up in here in a minute. Now, the real reasons and rationale will come long after the fact. If this turns into a bear market, well, it'll be because the economy worsened in 2020 and the market was discounting that, okay? Or some other reason, which we'll know long after the fact. Now, there's Bubba. Unless your Bubba, what is, is. Is the market going up? Is the market going down? Or is the market going sideways? Now, the smarter you are, as I alluded to, a few minutes ago, the harder it will be. The gentleman that called me a trend following moron was obviously someone who was much smarter than me, at least up until that point. And the reason he thought I was a moron was because he was beginning to interject, interject logic and reasoning into this market. And he began shorting it with both fists. At the same time, I was drawing big blue up arrows. And his arguments were quite convincing. All right, here we have Linda. I used to quote Linda all the time on this saying, as I've said before, I stopped quoting her because people started attributing the quote to me. And then I started seeing presentations where neither one of us <laughs> got credit for it. But Linda was the original one who said this. If you don't know what the trend is, ask a six-year-old kid. And down the road, I'd love to have enough time to put together a team of what it would be, it'd be first graders, second graders, whatever, and put them up against some of these Wall Street gurus and just see how the kids do. Show them what an up arrow is, show them what a down arrow is, and send them on their way. And again, smart people tend to interject logic into the equation. And as I often say, confuse the issue with facts. And they fight the trends. So again, it's trend following. Follows the keyword in that sentence. You need to recognize what current conditions are, up, down, or sideways. And what you need to do is stay with your old positions until proven wrong. And as I said a little while ago, that last correction that turns into a rollover will take you out and you will overstay your welcome. You're going to be a little late to the party and you're going to overstay your welcome. Now, you can change sides on new positions when a transition appears to be in the works and you will be a little late to the game. Just like I said, you'll be a, late, a little late to the party. 
So what I'm saying there is, let's say the market's rolling over and you're long a stock and long another stock and long another stock, and then you see the market or you start seeing some setups on the short side, some bow ties or whatever. So you go ahead and take this setup. Now this might start, might be the, bit, the start of something much bigger. And then you get another short, another short, another short. As I often say, let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. You're probably thinking, well, Dave, why not get all, out all the longs? Well, this one might not work out, and your longs might just have a little dip and then take off again. And, you know, maybe one or two will stop out. Maybe this one will turn into mother of all winners. And as I often preach, even if this short side starts developing really nicely, and you start making money on these positions, you might have one little stock in your portfolio that can defy gravity. And that one stock is all you need to make your year. And that's one of the problems. I don't mean to get sidetracked. Imagine that and you get sidetracked. But one of the problems, if I could ever solve for, you never see my fat ass again, is the fact that the methodology requires an outlier, or I should say the occasional outlier or outliers to really make money that your big money's in that that trend that does go that 200 percent or 300 percent or more it doesn't happen that often now in trend following you also have to be willing to sit on your hands when the market begins to chop sideways and you might get whipsawed out of your existing positions i get emails all the time dave why don't we just exit everything it's like well again you don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work and we're trend followers, we're just going to follow our plan. And our plan now is to give it a lot of room because we've been in this trend for a long time and we've already taken partial profits. So we're going to continue to follow it until proven wrong. And when are you proven wrong? Well, when you get stopped out. Okay. So again, take the free market timing course. Somebody, I, I'm just getting an email as I'm doing this. It should be on my website somewhere. And if not, just go to members area and sign up for the free members area and you'll see it. There's a start course, which is very introductory, but sometimes you got to go back to those basics. Even me, you know, the grand poobah has to remind himself of trend downtrend sideways. Don't try to outsmart the markets. So just look for that banner ad or go under members. All right, let's, Hop into the individual charts. We're having a roof put on the main house, or patched, I should say. So if you hear some loud noises in the background, that's what's going on. And, you know, the roofers tend to come in and ask me a bunch of questions. I guess because they know I'm an awesome contractor. <laughs> so if they come in, they wouldn't understand that I'm doing a webinar. So I started to tell them, but... I don't think they'd understand. They have a question they need to answer. It's going to rain soon. So anyway, if we get interrupted, my apologies on that. All right. Keep the questions coming, and I'll get the uh, charts shared up again. Okay. Yeah, good questions. Yeah. All right. We've got a bunch to talk about. Yeah. All right. Let me, let me hop through these charts real quick. They're running a uh, skill saw right outside my window. <laughs> All right, it always amazes me that when the market is off to the races and the next day has a bit of a shoulder shrug. And I see this happen over and over again. Everybody barely has to buy, and then the market comes right back in. I'm not sure why that happens, but it does. Now, NASDAQ is not updating for some reason, but we'll go back to the piece. And let's just put that weekly in here so we have today's data. And if you look at these bow ties, you can see we're pretty close to coming together and crossing. Even without today's data, you can see the NASDAQ has crossed over. Not completely, but it's in the process. And then again, the Russell 2000, as I said, quite a bit has crossed over. So there's no need to beat the dead horse on these things. But what I would like to show you just real quick, as you go through these sectors, there's energy, metals and mining, conglomerates, Consumer durables, non-durables, which you think would be doing a little bit better, look somewhat questionable. Automotive, food and beverage. So food and beverage, you would think, would be headed higher. Tobacco, people still smoke in a bear market. Some of us might smoke more. 
or other things. <laughs> Banks not doing so good in here. So as you go through these sectors, you can see most of these sectors, with a few exceptions like real estate, which is looking okay, not fantastic. And by the way, I would not rush out and use relative strength when the market is questionable like this. In other words, don't don't buy a market just because it is doing a little bit better than some other markets, okay? Another window is on top. Uh, it looks like I had an application that was uh, mucking with things. I said muck, YouTube. Don't demonetize me. Anyway, as you go through these sectors, I'm not sure which ones you saw, but most of them are just pretty ugly. And only a few on a relative basis, such as real estate, are doing okay. But I wouldn't get too excited about that. What I wanted to point out earlier is that the people, let's say, were picking bottoms here. Did they get out precisely right here? That's my question. Because if not, they made a round trip, and that prediction wasn't that good. So, or didn't work out, I should say. All right, let me see if I can find the questions. As you can see, not working out so great today. Usually I'm much better than this. My apologies. New and improved, huh? All right, let's see if we can get the... All right, here we go. Questions came back. Thank you, baby Jesus. All right. All right, hey, Dave, uh, I am in Neo. What do you think? That was one I was watching pretty closely for a while. And it, has be it is beginning to wake up again. My issue with this is, and it's like, don't confuse the issue with facts, but one of my concerns was that it's an auto manufacturer and is there enough excitement in an auto manufacturer to go after it? Now, it is a Chinese auto manufacturer. I think it's electric and all. So there is a, a little bit of a buzz in all these things. But the point I'm trying to get to is I held back on going after this one, thinking that let me wait for a secondary signal. And there's not enough time to get into it today. But if you go in again and watch that Q&A that I did a week or so ago, I talked about secondary signals versus pioneer type of signals in IPOs. And a pioneer signal is going to happen within the first couple of weeks. And then a secondary signal is going to happen sometimes thereafter. So with this, I would wait for more of a secondary type of signal. If you, I know you're already long, so stay long if you're already long. Just make sure you have a stop in place. And this one's so darn dang volatile, maybe the have a stop at the old lows, provided your position is not huge. But if I were to get long this one, I would have a stop at old lows. But I would wait for some sort of breakout or bow tie or something before looking to get the long this system. In fact, personally, what I would do is I would wait for a breakout and then look to play a pullback or let it bottom out for a long time and then possibly take a, a bow tie or something. Electro and they are burning money like Tesla. Yeah, you know, I was here on the radio, whatever. The big, what's the big, this, some big deal about all the subsidies for these electric cars are going to go away? What's going to happen to Tesla? What it does? I know I'm confusing the issue with facts, but Tesla looks okay, actually. I would not buy it because it's all over the place, but it's holding, it's holding up fairly well. John wants to talk about data as a short. I would pass on this one because. I hear what you're saying. It's kind of that gatekeeper look to it. But it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. If this was a nice clean uptrend and you had that big sharp V at high levels, then maybe. But I'm more interested in stocks that have made some serious thrusts down and have made some nice retrace retraces at this juncture. HD long. HD long? Are you kidding me? Who who said that? All right. Can I kick? How do I kick people out of here? Let me draw my big blue arrow. <laughs> Have you not been paying attention? You see, every week I come in here and I beat the dead horse. And you people, your eyes glaze over. You're like, Dave, why do you beat the dead horse so much? We get it. We get it. Follow the big blue arrow. And what's the first stock you'd ask about? A stock that's going down. 
I'm going to channel Nicholas Fine. No. <laughs> Rost as a short. All right. You just redeem yourself. Very good. Yes. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, the drop has been pretty significant given the volatility of the stock. So I would be a little leery to hop in and short it right here. I'd like to see more of a retrace. Okay. And the other reason that I probably wouldn't go after this one is you have a lot of support down below. Okay. So, but yeah, if I was just seeing this part here, Tarzan speak, this good. Okay. Big thrust down, followed by a pullback. I guarantee it's a bow tie. Look at that. Bow tie, bam. Okay. That looks like the mother of all tops. So, yeah, good job on that. Somebody's paying attention. Same person just asked me about the long. <laughs> so they just redeemed themselves. Um, but I would I would not trade it because of the support. And if it were a deeper retrace and didn't have the support right here, then, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, thank you, Paul, for getting my uh, six as a humor. You know, that's why I can't that's why I did the learning management system because I preach and preach and preach and preach. You know, uptrend, 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 downtrend, downtrend, sideways, sideways, sideways. And like we get it, we get it, we get it. And uh what's it? What was it? What was the caddyshack? No, you don't, Danny. <laughs> it's like, no, you don't get it. Obviously, you're still asking me about stocks that are going straight down or straight up. For shorts, at least. Amen is a long. No, it's too early in the process. Let it bottom out, okay? And it's still at relatively high levels if you look back to 2016. Uh, a little too early. You're fighting that big longer-term trend on this one. Where's the bow ties? Yeah, it's beginning to bow tie up. But I, I wouldn't take it just because I prefer something that has bottomed out quite a bit. I think your big blue arrow is still pointing down on that one. GNRC as a long. No, because bigger picture wise, you've got this kind of V pattern here, which looks like longer term. Let's take a look at like a weekly chart, maybe. That looks like a stock that's stalling out in its retrace. It could be in a lot of trouble. Plus, it's all over the place. So there's nothing for me there. TWLO. Yeah, that one I like. Uh, it's on the Landry list. Oh, wrong one. Is that the right one? No, there's another one. That's, this is not the one I was thinking of. I got a lot of T-stocks today. Maybe thinking of TWOU. Um, you want to go long or short this? Is it short? Uh, let's back the chart out a little bit. It's kind of got a gatekeeper look to it. I don't like this big gap higher. and It's got a little support down here. So it's kind of all over the place. So I would leave that alone. But, yeah, John, it could be in trouble. Let's take a look at the video. That's going to be a little bit better downtrend. My only problem with the video is you've got such a huge gap here. A little gap is a good thing, but sometimes you get these really big gaps, and it's just a little too much. But I hear you, and it's definitely in trouble. Maybe if it retraced up towards this gap and tested this gap, it might be worth a shot. But there's a few other shorts out there. If you look hard enough, you should be able to find them. Did we talk about this one? Yeah, we talked about that one. FTSB. Would you have bought FTSB? Okay, let's take a look at that. Let's see. Well, first of all, it's super duper thin, so I probably would not have bought it, and I did not have bought it. Have bought? I did not buy it. Um. It's just too thin, but let's let's just see if it's got some volume in it. And it's kind of all over the place, at least now in hindsight. And eh, it's got some volume here and there. In a case like this, where it's just kind of all over the place in an IPO, I'm more inclined to wait for a secondary type of signal. So if it continues to rally and then pulls back a little bit, then I might be more excited about it. Let me see if we could show you one. See, take a look at LTHM. We're long this in the trading service. It came public and died, but that's okay because it did take out that high and made like a nice retrace. So even though it shot lower, it took off and pulled back 
deeply. And so I thought this one was worth a shot, especially since our entry was up towards brand new highs. So that's a good looking IPO. It's something I'd be more interested in as opposed to this one, which is kind of all over the place and then took off in just one or two big updates. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. MO, it's not going to be a stock I like. MO. MO, except on the short side. MA broke the 50, the furthest point below, 50 narrows, high to lows, made higher price. You come by with a tight stop. You could buy with that. No, no, no. You people, you know, I'm going to keep. It's like, uh, <laughs> what was the story about the preacher that said the same thing every week? And one of the parishioners, or whatever you call those people, said, hey, I can't help but notice a preacher. You keep saying the same thing. It's like, well, I'm glad you noticed. I'm going to keep saying the same thing until you people get it. So why would you catch a falling knife? And it's all over the place anyway, but no. No, do you not understand a word I'm saying? I'm a trend follower. <laughs> Ask you about HD and roast baby. I'm a bipolar. <laughs> a little bit. Well, we you know, you're joking about that, but you know, we try to get we try to get some consistency. And I can't be everything in all markets. Now, maybe some people I met a guy once who claimed he was, and I think he was FOS. But he seemed to be shorting stocks when they were going high. He seemed to be like shorting stocks like super high like this right before they imploded. He claimed at least. And I'm kind of rolling my eyes because I claim BS. And, you know, if the market, as I've said before, if the market was breaking out, it was a breakout trade. Oh, yeah, it's a breakout trade. Ah, break it out. I'm playing breakout, breakouts now. Oh, market's reversed. I'm a reversal player. I just don't think you could do that. I think you end up chasing your own tail if you're trying to catch tops and follow trends at the same time or catch bottoms and follow trends. I think you're going to get into a lot of trouble really quick. And I think your brain is going to be conflicted. And like you jokingly said, you'll end up in a bipolar situation. Okay, Lynn is along. No, who said that? <laughs> now, this is your first time here. I don't want to pick on you. Now, let's see. Now, well, at least at the least, I'd wait for a bow tie. And here's the other problem. Look at the overhead supply on this thing, okay? So the most you'll make out of that trade is, what, 7 bucks? I mean, better than the poke in the eye, but as far as the risk is concerned, it's just not worth it. And the trend is obviously down. Um, if you take a look at the residential construction stocks, you'll see that which way are they headed. Well, they're still headed down for now. So, no. Uh Stop all about fishing, guys. Now, to each his own. If that's what you do, then do that. Just make that a big part of your life. Just like I was talking, I think it was also in the last Q&A session. Larry McMillan literally wrote the book on options, and Larry McMillan has a hedge fund that trades options, and he has a hedging strategy in his hedge fund where – and I forget the exact number. I think it's 8%. The market, if the market goes more than 8% against him, the hedge begins to kick in. Now, as a general statement, hedging is a bad idea. Hedge is, ex is expensive and hedging doesn't work. But he's figured out a way because he's an options genius and has made his entire life this. He's figured out a way. Oh, geez. He's figured out a way. I'm getting excited here. I knocked over my water. <laughs> he's figured out a way to hedge, but within, within certain caveats. So. If you make that your life, picking bottoms, then, then you know, bless. I hate to say you point a little head, but God bless you if that's what you do. Um, I found that it's just not feasible and not possible. And you get into a lot of trouble. Um, XLNX, well, it's trending higher, but what do you want to do with it? Uh, I don't see anything to do. And it's a little wide and loose and all over the place. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's up, it's up, down, up, down, up, down. You know, maybe on a pullback. <laughs> Thank you, guys. See, I'm just like the poor guy's first guy time here. This guy is crazy. All right, Paul, good job. Okay, Paul says S N E as a short. Yeah, that's what a short should look like. I'll show you a little trick, and then I, there's a few caveats, and I'll, I'll tell you why I don't. I wouldn't go after this one particularly. 
I used to have a thing in here. Well, let's see if I still have it. I changed systems. Well, just look at this blue line in here. So you got a thrust down followed by a pullback. So that looks pretty good. Now it's a foreign stock, so it does chop around a little bit. So give it the benefit of the doubt. But you've got a lot of support below the market, okay? And then you got this big fat gap way over here. I know it's way back in 2017. But given the nature, given the fact you've got so much support in here, I would pass on that one. Oh, cool. Well, thank you, Paul. Susie says, Dave, the market's not looking good in the moment. Yesterday was this Powell speech, and Donald could make a deal with the Chinese on Saturday or Sunday, so it could be an in-year rally. Well, you know, you're confusing the issue with facts, and there's a big problem with that. My gut is that, yeah, Trump's going to make a deal with China, okay? And the only reason I get a lot of my news through osmosis, and lately I've been more guilty ever since this, uh, ever since we have so many crazy things happen, crazy things happening, I have paid more attention to the news. But we were told by our builder that we need to buy our appliances before the end of the year, even though the house won't be ready for another nine months or longer because of some sort of deal with China and Trump and raising prices and the way he operates is he throws a shot across the bow, something extreme, and then he reels it back in a little bit. And nobody's figured that out yet, or at least most people haven't figured that out. So I think you're right. I think some deal will probably be made with China. However, you can't – let's say that that works out. Maybe the market already priced that in. Maybe it didn't. It's kind of like the Brexit thing. You know, it's like – you never know what the reaction is going to be. And a lot of time, what's the old, a lot of times, what's the old saying? It's already baked into the cake, so to speak. He got it done with Canada and Mexico. Yeah, maybe so. Extreme to the middle pragmatic. How about EFX as a short? I got you. I got to help you out, man. Thank you, Mike. Let's see what we got. EFA is going to be headed lower. Yeah, it's a little wide and loose, but, yeah, these are the EFA shares, which I think is everything – except I get this one and some else confused, but it's foreign shares. Uh, it's okay. I mean, definitely downtrending, so can't argue with that. But your entry would have been on this last little pullback. So if you're short, stay short. But, yeah, Mike, that's um, definitely still in a downtrend. Okay, we got time for just a couple more. I'll be happy to get to them. FTSV, bow tie up. Bow tie. Well, that's what I call a forced bow tie, okay? So a bow tie, you have to, I learned early on, you have to look at designer's intent or developer's intent, whatever you want to call it. A bow tie is made to catch gradual changes in trend. This is not a gradual change in trend, so that's what I call a forced bow tie. So I'd be more interested in a bow tie in something like like a metals and mining that's been bottoming out for six years or an energy company or something like that as opposed to a bow tie like this in something that just melted straight up so i hear you c y h as a long yeah i mean here's a stock that's improving uh it's just all over the place but it kind of illustrates my point as to when to trade a bow tie, okay? So a bow tie in something like this, which has been bottoming forever, and then makes a real nice little bow tie, would excite me more than something that just went straight up and then the bow tie formed automatically. Now, let's zoom it in and pick it apart a little bit. You do have a lot of overhead resistance in here, and it is kind of wide and loose, OK, so I would have a hard time getting excited about it. But as far as a bow tie goes, yes, that's the type of bow tie you want to trade off of major, major, major lows just turning up. OK. All right. Any more? We've got time for maybe two more. Sorry about all the technical issues today. Hopefully we'll iron those out. I just hate to put another monitor in here. I'm a glow at night when I go to bed. <laughs> all right. Any uh, any last questions? Oh, you're welcome, Howard. 
Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, just a reminder, we won't do a show next week because I'm going to St. Lucia. I am Charlie Kirk's, Charlie Kirk's, Charles Kirk, <clears throat> Charles Kirk's, easy for me to say, guest of honor for his retreat. And then that's going to overlap to the following week. So it's going to be a couple of weeks before we do a show. I think the next show is going to be around the 20th of December. Just check the uh, the website. Everybody have a uh, Margot Bay. Okay, I'll check it out. Margot Bay, you've been there? Cool. Your honeymoon. Ah, awesome. What's the reason you're not day trading? Well, because it's you're making too many decisions. And we're only wired to make so many decisions. You've got a high burnout rate, and you could get sucked into a lot of decisions, and you're making too many observations. I do occasionally take a... Opening gap reversal trade in something like the indices, but I try not to get sucked into doing that too much because I could find I find you 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 end up chasing your own tail. Your real money is in the longer term trade. So I would encourage you, if you are day trading, Paul, what I'd suggest you do is figure out a way to hold on as long as you can in your day trade so don't get in and out all day try to get in as early in the morning as possible when you have a signal of course and then try to hold on all day don't smoke too much pot they have pot down there well i'll be down there in business so i won't be doing that i'm not uh what's his name go to the restaurant in the pitons on the farm in the mountains all right that sounds like a fun thing to do plus i'll be down there in business so i have to i'll stay away from any recreational things like that <laughs> but, yeah, I will uh, check that out. All right. Again, everybody, uh, have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And then hopefully I'll see you guys in about, uh, I guess, about three weeks. Thank you so much.